Greetings, everyone. I'm Larry Williams, the director of the Center for the Advancement of Research Methods and Analysis, or CARMA, at Wayne State University. And uh, it's October 25th, 2013, and uh, we're very excited to have you join us for our recording of the Meet the Methodologist uh, interview. Uh, our guest today is here to give a webcast lecture, uh, and it is a real pleasure. Uh, Gilad is the, uh, currently is a Ralph Tizer Professor of OB and Department Chair at the University of Maryland. Uh, you may know he's an uh, Associate Editor and Incoming Editor of the Journal of Applied Psychology. He has uh, won early career awards by both the Academy of Management and the Society for Industrial Organizational Psychology. And, like our first presenter of the year, Kevin Corley, Gilad uh, got started with Karma when he was a grad student at uh, George Mason University. So, Gilad Hinn, it's a pleasure to have you join Karma at Wayne State. Happy to be here. So, uh, tell us a little bit about how you got to Penn State and to George Mason, uh, how that happened, and what your experiences were like, as you recall them. Sure. So, so I got interested in psychology uh, from sports, actually. Um, I was a swimmer growing up, competitive swimmer, and uh, uh, at some point I was working with a sports psychologist and uh, found out that I'm more interested in learning why he's asking me the questions that he's asking me versus getting any benefits from his work. But uh, I was interested in that and then found out about I.O. psychology and, and so forth. Um, uh, swimming also got me into Penn State. I was uh, on the swim team there. Um, and then got more and more interested in learning about motivation and leadership and things like that. And uh, George Mason was sort of a good fit as a next step. And that's how one thing led to another. Yeah, yeah. So how, what, what do you think of when you think about a good fit? I mean, like, what was it for you that was a good match with what you were interested in? Um, so, uh, in terms of uh, the... At, at Mason. At, at Mason. And uh, so, Mason has a really good group in terms of uh, studying uh, leadership and motivation. So, folks like Steve Zaccaro, um, you know, Jose Cortina, Rich Klamaski, who was there, Stan Gali at the time. Mm -hmm. um, it's a great place to get methods training, too. Um, I think that the method training I got there particularly from Jose Cortina and Stan Gali, who was there at the time, was just top-notch, so. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, obviously the, the time that one invests in a doctoral program uh, spans several years, and you take away things that you hope will help you as you move on with your career. Uh, what do you think were some of the most important things you learned at Mason as a grad student that uh, help you now? Um, there's, there's a lot of things. I think that the, the basic training I got there, both in the s substance of psychology and, and the methods part, uh, were really good. I think that, um, you know, working with Rich Klamaski on my dissertation, he was very, um, it, it was great to work with in terms of, he was a, he's a good ID man in terms of, you know, helping me develop ideas, but he also kind of let me run things as I'd like, which basically means that I've learned through trial and error a lot. Mm -hmm. And that was sort of a good combination of getting really solid method training on the one hand, and uh, the, on the substance uh, side, having people who you can run a lot of ideas by and, and let you do what, what you want to do at that, that stage. So it was a good combination for me. Yeah. Uh, so after leaving uh, George Mason, uh, you've been on the faculty at three great universities, uh, Georgia Tech, Texas A&M and now University of Maryland. Uh, you've also made the transition from getting a degree in psychology to being a faculty member uh, in the business school. And I was wondering if you can comment kind of on your transition in general about your transition from being a graduate student to being a faculty member, sure. how it turned out to be similar or different from what you thought it would be, and then also your transition from being a faculty member in a psychology uh, department to being in a business. Sure. So research-wise, I don't think um, I don't think it changed a lot. I mean, I think that you could do the same research in business and, and psych departments. I, I mean, the environment is different, but the, the research is, that we see is pretty similar. Um, I think where differences come to play is in um, uh, different career emphasis. Um, you know, so in psych you get pressure for grant, in business school you get pressure for 
the professional development of managers through MBA and executive programs. Um, but you know, what, one thing that is also a little different is in the PhD student training. Um, in psych, it, it tends to be a little more, um, you know, it, it tends to be a little more training emphasis on the method part, which I think is more solid. And in, in the basic discipline in business, it's 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 more broad in terms of getting the you know the, the management field more broadly. Um, so I, I don't know how it influenced my research per se. I mean, it seems like I've progressed independently on the research front and, and things like that, but clearly colleagues have changed and, and things around me have changed that, mm -hmm. that have fed into what I do. Mm -hmm. so. well, how about the transition from being a grad student to being a faculty member? Was, it, uh, what, was there anything that life as a faculty member, any way in which it's different than what you thought it would be as a grad student? Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, I still miss being a PhD student. I think that that's a really fun time. Uh, in some sense, you know, you get to uh, you get a lot of time to to study new things. Which you know, as we get as we go f from graduate students to assistant professors to full professors, you know, that as you you, you do more, you have less discretionary time to 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 study and to, and to learn new things. Uh, so that that part I miss. Um, but you know, I, I like the autonomy that we get as faculty, and 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 you can do pretty much what you want to do within the parameter of our field, which is pretty broad. So I, I actually, you know, I, it's a pretty good life, I think, in terms of academia, mm -hmm. <laughs> if you can handle the, the research part. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, speaking of the research part, uh, you know, it, it's often said that. Uh, the failures or mistakes that we make along the way create uh, the opportunities to learn and improve. And I was wondering whether you, as you reflect back on the earlier stages of your career, uh, were there any uh, oh experiences? We don't have to call them mistakes, but you know things about what you've learned that you learned along the way yep. that you think help have helped you subsequently be as successful as you have become. Yeah, so I, I did a lot of mistakes early on, and, and if you talk to my uh, graduate school professor, they'll 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 give you an earful of that, um, I'm sure. Uh, but but you know, as as one example, uh, uh, first paper I've ever sent to JP. Um, uh, I think for one of the scales, I forgot to reverse score the items, uh, and reviewers were wondering about those negative loading. Um, that, that came up, and uh, and I remember uh, the professor I worked with at the time, Stengali, closed the door behind us and 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 you know gave me an earful, and and that was a good learning experience because now now I make sure that when I work with PhD students, I I, I, I go into those fine detail and 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 you know I've learned to sort of be more detail oriented as a result, so that was a good experience in a way, mm -hmm. and you know and I've experienced failure through uh, you know. Uh, I had a pretty bad batting average of getting revisions uh, accepted. I had a lot of R and Rs early on that got rejected, and but that really taught me how to address reviewers' concerns. And mm -hmm. you know, so so long as you learn from mistakes, that, that's perfectly fine. Yeah. So uh, well, you learn from mistakes, and you also learn from your experiences. And I'm always interested in how those who have experiences as reviewers or editors, uh, how that influences them as a researcher or scholar. So uh, how do you think you have improved or benefited as a researcher from those kinds of reviewing editorial experiences? Well, I, I think that uh, uh, both in terms of you know, I've been blessed with a lot of great mentors, uh, you know, both at George Mason and beyond, uh, that, you know, I've really taken the time to learn from them. I think that's really important. Um, and then I think that, that along those, the same line, I think that the reviewing, the reviewing for journals and then having the opportunity to, to be associate editor, it really teaches you to get perspective from multiple sides, uh, and which makes you a better scholar. Um, I, I can anticipate much better when I submit a paper, what reviewers might want to see and, and, and what editors might want to see and how you could kind of juggle it. Uh, you know, so simple examples would be uh, knowing when a paper is not ready, uh, knowing when you need to maybe get another data collected so mm -hmm. you make a bigger bang for the buck, if you will. Um, 
you know, so, so those kind of experiences, you know, and, and how to frame things come with, with, with immersing yourself in the review process as, a, mm -hmm. as an active participant, both as an author and as a reviewer and then now as an action editor. Yeah, and so as you look across uh, those experiences, are there uh, any kind of common uh, mistakes uh, that you have seen that, that authors could have helped themselves out in the first round had they been paying a little bit more attention to these things? Yeah, I think that uh, I, I think that that submitting papers prematurely is, tends to be pretty obvious. So, you know, being rejected from one journal and then send another the same paper to another journal without changing the formatting is a common mistake that you see uh, mm -hmm. that shows lack of care. Mm -hmm. um, I think that. That sending a paper that that clearly can't be better but hasn't been developed fully on a theory method front um, th those are the broad mistakes I mean it's it's kind of hard to point specific because mm -hmm. there's a lot of different ways in which it manifests but, but I think that 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 really taking the time to craft a good paper uh, it takes more time before you submit but the chances of success is much greater Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that tends to come across. Reviewers pick up on it pretty quickly, and as do editors. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, as I indicated in uh, my brief intro, you've obviously been very successful uh, as a scholar and as a reviewer, and, and now you're the department chair at, uh, in your department at the University of Maryland. And so uh, you're juggling uh, a lot of responsibilities uh, in those roles and also as a husband and father of two daughters and I was wondering if you'd comment on you know kind of how you approach you know the self-management of your work and juggling all your work responsibilities that enables you to continue to be so successful and then how it is that you balance the work family uh, arrangement to be as, as successful as if you've been there as well? Um, so it, it's funny when you're in it uh, you don't feel successful right because you, you see all the little you know bumps in the road that, that mm -hmm. comes across but but I think at the end of the day uh, it, you know if you know what your passion is and you kind of pursue that so, so I really I care a lot about my personal life um, and, and I care a lot about my research and, and, and collegiality and with colleagues. And, and so long as you kind of don't, don't lose sight of the, the important things, I think you can juggle more uh, around that, um, you know, either by being efficient yourself and or working well with others to accomplish it. Um, so I think it's a matter of priorities and it's a matter of uh, learning, learning your limits and, uh, and, and, and finding how to work well with others broadly defined, you know, in terms of getting things done um, mm -hmm. so, uh, that, that enable that. Yeah, some people, for example, when you're carving out the writing side, uh, some people have a certain time of day that they like, other people have a certain location that works for them, yep. other people it's like it may change from day to day, they yeah. can sit down and turn it on. What's your particular style? So, I have a weird style uh, of... Uh, I, I, I work best when I have variety, so that, which I think lend itself well to the fact I do a lot of things. So if I, just, if I just take three days and do nothing but writing a paper, I'll do a, a bad job. Mm -hmm. I, just don't, I, I need some variety. So, so I, 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 can, uh, I can get in and out of writing in, in the middle of juggling other things pretty easily, and in some time that, that actually helps. Uh, you know, sometimes I, if I run into a problem, I don't keep I don't keep banging the head in the in the, you know, in the wall and, and try to get it done right then. I, I would take off, go work out or something, and then things would come up. Some of the best studies I've designed in my head were while working out, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. Or I find that if I go to conferences or vacations, sometime when I come back, that's when mm -hmm. some of those ideas come. So it's kind of learning to self-regulate in, in what works for you that, that I think helps. Uh, and the fact that I can juggle, that, that juggling is one of my self-regulation -regula uh, strategies helps mm -hmm. in that sense. Yeah. 
Yeah, for others it may come while singing in the shower. I mean, it happens. Uh, I don't do that. <laughs> um, well, uh, related, one thing I didn't mention in those various roles is your success uh, as a mentor of doctoral students. And I, I know that you've had several that have gone on to have uh, very successful uh, careers and successful appointments at research schools. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, how you work with doctoral students? Yeah. So that's another difference, I think, between business school and psych a little bit, that in psych you end up mentoring more PhD students than in business school. Uh, and, and in Maryland we have a system where we, you know, most students work with multiple faculties, so it's not really, you don't take a lot of the full ownership in, in developing students. So, so I didn't have as many PhD students, uh, but I was fortunate to have, you know, a few very good ones. Um, but. But I can't take full credit in the sense that they also benefit a lot from working with other colleagues. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I think it really it, our system is more of a village, you know, kind of train the, uh, the you know the whole department kind of train the, the student, uh, and then eventually somebody takes ownership of the dissertation more than other. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, you know, it, it's a combination of having great students and having a lot of good colleagues that, that work well together in, in mentoring them. Yeah. yeah, takes a village. Yep. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you're here to, uh, to give what will be your second webcast. I haven't given one a few years back while Carmen was at uh, Virginia Commonwealth University. Uh, so, could you tell us a little bit about uh, the beginnings of your interest in this topic and uh, give us a preview of what you're going to be talking about? Yes, yeah, so early on I was really interested in research on motivation, uh, but I was also very interested in teams and leadership research. Teams and leadership research, a lot of it is sort of at the team level, obviously, and motivation has been in the individual level. And, uh, and, and I didn't want to pick. I didn't want to pick and choose what I, what I do. So I, I, the, the natural vehicle that allow you to integrate them is multi-level research. Um, so I just kind of taught myself how to integrate them through multi-level research and um, you know, kind of figure out not just how to use the methods, but how to share it with others in, in teaching over time. And, uh, and, that, and that sort of got me to be, uh, to develop some expertise in multi-level methodology. Mm -hmm. um, but not just the method part, I think that, that for me the method is, is, a, is a mean to an end versus an end of itself. And there's some methodologies that are, that are more pure methodologies in terms of the end, some are using it means to an end, I'm more of the, the latter. Um, and so I, I look at it as a way to open up opportunity to, for more interesting research. Uh, but to do that, I need to have the, the, the research design and statistical approaches that allow you to do that. So, mm -hmm. so sort of in terms of what I'll talk today is more of a broad overview uh, of where we've been, where we're going. Uh, a lot of it is based on collaborative work I've done with uh, John Matthew and Paul Blizzy in particular, mm -hmm. um, and kind of thinking about levels issues and then the methodological uh, implications to, to doing work in that domain. Yeah, well it, it must have been, uh, you seem to you have come into sort of the, the prime of your career at a time when multi-level theory and methods were were growing exponentially, so it must have been a pretty, a pretty uh, exciting thing to be engaged with. It, it, it has been. Uh, it's been very rewarding, and, and, and I think it, it helped me. It helped my research too, because it, the, the hardest part of research is finding a contribution, and and I think it was an easy sailing, quote unquote, in terms of it. By doing multi-level research, uh, it was easier to convince people of the importance of the work. But what, one thing I'll mention today is based on a, a largely of an article I worked with uh, John Matthew, Journal of Management, mm -hmm. that. It talks about the need to kind of take the next step. So, so the, the latter part of the talk, we talk about here are some challenges that can be really exciting opportunities moving forward uh, in multi-level research in, in organizations. So, so that part, hopefully others would also pick up and, and run with, because I think there's a lot more we can do there. Yeah. Well, so many of the people that get attracted to uh, IO and OBHR start out kind of with a, with a person psychological micro focus. So do you think it's easier to help students uh, learn about multi-level methods or multi-level theory? 
I think if you try to do one without the other, you're not going to be as successful because the method part, the method part could lead you to the wrong direction if you don't consider the the uh, theoretical context, the substantive context, not just theoretical context that, that you study it. And um, organizations are too complex for just theory and just method. I think it's really the integration of them that that gives us in our field the, the advantage of other fields. Um, so, you know, the, I, think, I think that just doing the method part, you know, we've seen instances where just the method part would lead you to, to tools that are not as useful to mm -hmm. researchers, and vice versa, we've seen theories that are untestable as well. So those who can combine the two, I think, uh, end up being a little more influential in a field. Yeah. Well, we appreciate your, your comments and your suggestions. Uh, our hope is that with these interviews, uh, particularly aspiring doctoral students will watch it on our YouTube channel. Any kind of final words of advice you'd like to offer? Uh, just thank you for what you're doing, Karma. I think that's a wonderful service. Uh, I, I can tell you that I've heard all over the world now that uh, students and faculty really benefit from this so yeah. so thank you Larry yeah. as well for uh, thank uh, you. what you guys are doing here so <laughs> Man. so well uh, I don't think I spelled it out so clearly but again uh, Gilad was here uh, to participate in the Karma Consortium webcast program uh, the lecture he'll be delivering in about an hour I think is our about our 90th one and for those of you who are watching this on our YouTube channel but may not know uh, much about us, uh, visit the Karma website uh, and learn about what we do. We not only have our webcast program, uh, but we have a very active short course program uh, delivering short courses across the world. And we're very excited that Gilad will be coming back in June to do an advanced uh, multi-level course. So uh, we're thankful for all the contributions you have made over the years, Gilad. It's great to have you back, my friend. Thank you. Yep.